Hi everyone, my name is Chelsea. Welcome to Little Mountain Ranch. Welcome to my grow room. I am really happy to have you here with me today and excited to be here in my grow room with you. This is a project we have been working on over the last couple of weeks and we are just about finished. There are a couple of little things that we need to do to just button it up, but we're, we're <laughs> my mouth just didn't want to work there but we are waiting for a few things to come in the mail just to finish it up and then we need to get the trim on I just want to touch on one thing first before I get into showing you where we're at with the grow room right now and that is this wallboard that you can see here this is the same um, wallboard that they use on skating rinks so it's actually a plastic I'm not sure what the technical name is for it but I'll ask Dan and I'll put it down in the show notes for you and the reason that we chose this board is because we wanted this room to be uh, watertight basically so that the humidity that would come off the plants couldn't get into the walls and call it, cause any mold issues. So when Dan was doing research into it, this board came up. So we decided to give it a try. And I just wanted to share with you something that we have learned about this board that we did not know before and we didn't find online when we were doing research. Because it is a plastic board, it tends to expand and contract quite a bit. And we did not take that into consideration when we built it. So what's been happening is when we turn the heater on to keep, because obviously we want to keep the room nice and warm for germinating seeds, um, the board expands. And when it does that, it tends to ripple a little bit. I'm not sure if you can see it's not really rippled right now because I did turn the heat off earlier but it tends to ripple quite a bit. So um, there's a couple of things that we are going to do uh, to make it so that hopefully it doesn't ripple quite as bad. There's nothing really we can do com to completely eliminate the issue, but um, Dan's going to drive a couple more screws in to the wall. He is also considering putting a strip of wood along where all the seams are. We have um, siliconed all of the cracks, but obviously when things are expanding and contracting, that silicone is starting to crack a little bit. Even though we used 100% pure silicone, it's still doing that. <laughs> and the other thing too is because of the type of board this is, the silicone is not wanting to stick to it very well either, which is also something we didn't know prior to using it. Um, and then the other thing he's going to do is to pull out the screws and make the screw holes a little bit bigger. So there's a little bit of wiggle room in there for expansion. Um, we did vapor barrier the walls that are insulated and made sure that we sealed them all up really well. So this is just kind of an extra precaution, um, but we, we obviously don't wanna be having big cracks or gaps or anything in it for moisture to get in behind. Because I've mentioned this on a couple of my videos, I didn't want to not share with you that we are having some issues with it. So once we get it all figured out, and have it kind of working properly, then I'll let you know what we did to solve this kind of issue with the slight rippling that's going on. That being said, I really do love the way that it looks. We did the ceiling in it as well, the back wall and this wall, as well as the wall that's behind me here where the door is. This wall right here is actually um, mason block. Is that what it's called? The big gray concrete blocks. I did paint it with several coats of paint, uh, like a paint sealer primer. And the reason that I did that is number one, I really like the white, it's really bright and clean looking, but also because the concrete itself was actually absorbing moisture out of my seed trays. Anywhere that was touching the wall was actually absorbing the moisture and that's not uncommon with concrete, it is quite porous. So I'm hoping by painting it, that's going to um, solve that problem. So let me show you what I have growing up over in these three trays. I only have three trays started right now. I have a tray of peas. So these will be used as a microgreen. So they'll get about this high or so, and then we'll cut them off. We can use them in stir fries or in salad. And check this out. The tomatoes just germinated this morning. They're just starting to come up. In behind the tomatoes, we have some radishes, and the germination wasn't fantastic on the radishes, as you can see, so I'm going to go through, I'll give them another couple days, but I'm going to go through and fill the rest of these with lettuce. This back half of the tray here, this is a mescaline mix, and these ones germinated really well, but the lettuce on this side didn't. So again, I'm gonna do the same thing and just reseed this area with some fresh lettuce seed. But I cannot tell you how good it does my heart to have green things growing. 
Oh, one of you guys suggested this awesome trick to me. So what these are, I mentioned how I use popsicle sticks to label all of my seed trays and somebody said to take a yogurt container and cut it into strips like so. So I have a whole bunch of them. I have one of these China markers. I got this one from West Coast Seeds and I can write on these and then I can erase them and reuse them year after year. And this is obviously food grade plastic because it comes from um, food from the yogurt containers. And it was really good because I actually don't buy yogurt pretty much ever. I think it's been, I don't even know how many years since I bought yogurt consistently, but I'm not making yogurt right now. And we actually had just purchased two tubs of yogurt a couple of days before the suggestion was made. So I had two tubs of yogurt to make these with. This is brilliant. I love this idea. So I have relabeled all of my tomatoes here that were labeled with just little pieces of uh, masking tape. Let's talk grow lights. I'm going to show you what grow lights I've been using for the last, I don't know, three or four years at least. So they're a double light like so. They have these, these actually slide off, but the little reflectors on them and little hangers on the back. And I think when I bought these four years ago or so, they were somewhere around $50 for a pack of four of them. So I went into my Amazon and I ordered, I just reordered these ones and I'll show you how they came. This is what they're doing now. So they're actually one light tube, but they have two light, um, I don't even know what you would call them, light emitters on either side and they kind of face out. So when we plugged this one in beside one of those, this one was actually brighter than the ones with the double lights on them. So I was happy to see that. When I first started growing on these shelves, I used just one of these double lights per shelf. And it was okay, but one of the things that happened were that the plants that were on the end, uh, on either end, got a little bit laggy. And what laggy means is that they developed a long stem because they're trying to reach up towards the light. So what I did was I decided to put two lights per shelf and that completely eliminated the problem. One of the other things to keep in mind when you are hanging lights and you are starting seeds is you actually want your lights to be fairly close to your plants. In fact, these could actually have gone up, even be this high or have the lights lower down. So they're only a few inches away from the trays. And then as the plants grow, you can raise the lights up. So I currently don't have good hooks that are easy to extend. I was actually just using twine, tying it and lowering them, which was a total pain. There were multiple times that I actually ended up dropping lights onto my plants. So Dan is in the process of looking around for me for some good hooks that I can put on that I can easily just raise and lower. So that's something else to consider if you're setting up a space like this. For a pack of six of these lights, and where did that piece of paper go with the name on it? And they're called Monius, right here. And uh, they were, I think, around $150 Canadian for a pack of six. And remember that each one of the lights actually has two strips of light, so they are quite bright. You could actually get away with one light per shelf if you wanted to turn your trays this way and have the one light hanging over them, that would probably be adequate, but I like to fit as many trays on my shelves as possible. These shelves are four feet wide. They can fit four of these standard trays, like so, if you are putting them the way that I have them here, or they can fit two going across. So depending on how much you are planning on growing, you can choose which way you wanna do it. Okay, let me show you what Dan and I got up to earlier today. This is uh, our exhaust fan. This is just a standard bathroom exhaust fan. And Dan is just waiting for the um, device that he's gonna to attach to this that will regulate the humidity in the room. So we'll be able to set what we want the humidity at. And then this fan will turn on if the humidity gets too high. And then he cut some holes in the shelving here and has run this exhaust pipe. And then he has attached it to one of the old flues that we're no longer using for our chimney uh, because that was when actually the only way that we could think of <laughs> besides getting rid of this window and putting something in there this window doesn't open anyway so we would have had to entirely replace it but since we had this unused exit here for air we decided to hook it up there even though we have all of these precautions for humidity the puck board on the walls the fact everything's really well sealed and vapor barriered and all of that 
and the exhaust fan were actually not super concerned about a huge humidity buildup in here. We actually live in a very dry climate and particularly in the winter time, which is when I do my indoor growing, uh, because we have wood heat, which dries the air out like crazy. We actually need to add humidity to the air upstairs, but also we live in just a naturally dry climate anyway. We don't have huge issues with mold in this region. So these are just extra precautions. We thought if we were gonna build a space like this, we might as well build it with all of the potential issues that might happen. Um, to be circumvented at the beginning rather than having to solve them later on. So that's kind of why we've gone to such extreme lengths in here. We also bought these manual um, timers. So the lights plug in to either side and I'll be setting these for 12 hours for the grow room. I went with manual rather than digital because I just like manual better. <laughs> They're just easier and they tend to break uh, way less frequently than um, digital stuff does. So we got two of these. There's a couple more things. So as you can see, Dan got the trim on the window up here. So we just need to trim around the door behind you. Um, what else do we need to do? Put in the humidity regulator. And then we're going to be building a countertop. Obviously this is a pretty small room. We had considered doing a countertop along this side of the wall, but just with the room being so narrow, there would really not be a lot of room for me to maneuver around here. I am going to, so there'll be one shelf. There might be two smaller shelves up there. I'm not sure yet. And then a shelf on the bottom for me to store my trays. I'll also have a bin of soil down here that I, so that way I can just do all of my planting and everything right in this room, which is really exciting. One of the other things that's really important in a grow room space is of course warmth. So I do have a little plug-in heater down there. And then I also have just a really basic little fan and this is for air circulation. Because this is such a kind of a perfect growing space, everything is controlled, climate controlled in here. The plants can get a, develop a little bit of weakness in their stems. So if you keep the air circulating around your seedlings, so there's a little bit of wind movement, it actually helps to strengthen your seedlings and make them stronger for transplanting outside. What we'll probably do actually, now that I'm thinking of it, we probably will put a shelf up here and then I can set the fan right up there to blow down on all of my seedlings on the shelves here. I am very much looking forward to having this completely filled with little seedlings. So I think I had one more light that I needed to do here. This little reflector just slides right down the side of the light like so. And there's one piglets. If you follow me over on Instagram, then you have probably been following along with the birth of Dinah's piglets. I was able to film a little bit of it, so I will share that with you a little bit later on in this video. But her piglets are doing fantastic, and thankfully, Mother Nature has been cooperating and it has been nice and warm, so I haven't had to use any supplementary heat or bring the piglets inside or anything like that. As you can see, I don't have any running water in here, but I do have a sink just out behind the door. So what I do, for those of you that missed this from my last video, is I use one of these sprayers that's intended for chemicals for um, like weed control outside. When I am watering my seedlings, when they're really tiny or before the seeds have actually germinated, I use the fine mist sprayer. But once they get to the point where they are now, I just take it off and that way the water comes out of here a little bit more vigorously so it's not quite, quite so time consuming. So all I'm doing right now is building up the air pressure inside of the canister. And then I just water like so. Super handy little tool, I love it. Um, I'll make sure that I put links for the shelves, the lights, and the sprayer. Uh, for those of you that are interested, I know that normally if I mention something like a product that I'm using that I really love, then you guys would like to know where I get it. So this one was from Princess Auto. The lights and the shelving are both from Amazon. Okay, I think what we'll do now is head over to the freeze dryer room 
and I'll talk a little bit about the freeze dryer and why I haven't been posting any content about freeze drying because you guys know how excited I am about freeze drying and my freeze dryer. So I'll fill you in on that in a second. And then after that, we'll head out to the barn and I'll give you an update on the piglets. And while we're out there, I'll share a little bit of the footage of the piglet birth. So here is our freeze dryer room. And this is one of the beautiful countertops that Dan made me. This is built in the same way as our pantry is as well. So this will look very similar to the one that he's going to put into the grow room. So let me fill you in a little bit on the freeze dryer itself. When we got our freeze dryer and got it all hooked up and everything, there was some issues with it. What we determined after working with Harvest Right for about a week trying to figure out what was going on is that during the shipping process, because it came all the way from Utah, all the way up to us in Canada, um, is that something got dislodged in the internal components of the freeze dryer. So they have sent us another one. It's actually here right now. Dan's going to be picking it up in the morning. So I am very, very excited to get freeze drying. As you can probably imagine, I am pretty much chomping at the bit to um, start running through all of the things that I have fantasized about for the last month um, through the freeze dryer. Okay, let's head outside. It has been ridiculously warm for over a week and we just checked the weather again and it's gonna be warm again for another week. Let's go in the barn. Hi, Elvis. Hi, Missy. Scratch. They have a couple of chicken friends, apparently. So all of the other piglets, you can see the pile moving, are all underneath here. That's so cute. How adorable. I love it when they get big enough that they're able to bury themselves underneath the hay like this. So cute. So her piglets look exactly the same as uh, Emily's piglets. So there's a couple white and um, black spotted ones, a couple black ones, a couple orange ones. So now I'll show you a little bit of footage of these piglets being born. <laughs> so I just went up to the house to go to the bathroom and grab a drink. And I came down and just as I opened up the door, this little piglet was born. <laughs> you little cutie. I know it's really tempting to go in there and try to help them, but it is better just to let everybody be. Yeah, you got a little piglet here, mama. There you go. Good job. Nice healthy piglet. It's okay. Stay down. Good girl. There we go. That's a girl. No, no, no. Stay down. That's a girl. That's a girl. That's it. So cute, hey? It always surprises people how quickly piglets come out and how mamas don't end up cleaning off their babies. That's something that a lot of people don't know about pigs. Unlike most mammals who lick their babies off, they don't. And they're extremely fiercely protective of their babies and really good moms. But um, the babies come out and they kind of get cleaned off as they make their way through the hay over to mama's teats for their first nursing. And then usually within about 20 minutes, they're completely dry, just on their own. Okay, we are back in the kitchen and I wanted to show you our sprouts from the other day. So this is day four for the sprouts. And look at that. So that's one and a half tablespoons of alfalfa seeds. Nice full quart jar. And what I'm going to do with these now is give them a good rinse. And then I will put them in the fridge in a container like a Ziploc bag or whatever and then we'll use these up over the next couple of days on sandwiches or salads. Talk about an easy way to grow some greens in the winter time, hey? So I just had these in my window over there, rinsed them two, two or three times a day 
and now we have green so I'll start another jar of these once I get these ones into the fridge. I'm going to make macaroni and cheese and this is my dad's very cheesy macaroni and cheese recipe. My dad was all about everything at the most decadent level that you could possibly have it. And so he used a lot of cheese. My kids love it when I actually do grandpa's mac and cheese. I do mac and cheese all the time, but not quite with this much cheese. So I am out of elbow macaroni. So I am going to use some penne and I have my salted water over here. All I do to make a cheese sauce is I make a simple white sauce to start and then I add cheese to it and I'm going to be adding some grated cheddar cheese. You can experiment with any kinds of cheese you want. You can get fancy and do some fancier, stronger flavored cheeses. And I'm also going to be adding some cream cheese. This is the probably the secret ingredient for the really smooth and cheesy sauce. I wonder if I have any other kinds of cheese left over from Christmas I could throw in there. I do have some Swiss, so I think I'll throw in a, a couple of pieces of Swiss cheese as well. Why not? If you're going to have macaroni and cheese, you may as well have serious macaroni and cheese. Mmm, Swiss cheese is so good. And you can alter these ingredients to fit the size of family you have as well, of course. So I'm going to put some butter into my saucepan over there and you can adjust the amount of butter according to the number of people that you are feeding. I use twice as much flour to the amount of um, butter that I have. And then I added four cups of milk to that. And then I'll just cook this up until it starts to thicken a little bit. And for seasonings, you can just do whatever you like. I'm going to add half a teaspoon of garlic powder. And if I had mustard powder, I would be adding a little bit of mustard powder as well. I'm going to add a little bit of basil, which would probably horrify my dad because it just needs to be about the cheese. A little pinch of salt, just a little pepper. A little pepper goes a long way. But you really can season this whatever way you like. And this is starting to thicken now. Okay, so now I'm gonna take this off of the heat now that it is as thick as I want it. And I am going to add two pieces of Swiss cheese to this. And two cups of grated cheddar cheese. But we're going to add half a block of cream cheese. And we'll stir all those cheeses in there until they're melty. Okay, <clears throat> take our cheese sauce, pour it on top of our pasta. Okay, so now we're gonna get even more extreme. We're gonna add some more cheese on the top. My dad would add like, you know, a pound of cheese <laughs> to the top. I'll just put a little sprinkle. And then we'll pop it in the oven and cook it till it's all bubbly. All right, everyone, that is it for today's video. I hope you enjoyed it and I look forward to seeing you next time. Bye.